Amen. Grab your Bibles and open to Tay Tay. Can you grab that phone? Thank you. <laughs> John chapter 18. This morning we're in John chapter 18, verses 1 through 11. As we continue our study through the Gospel of John. Before we read this morning's passage, I want to ask you a question to in some ways ground this passage of Scripture in our hearts and direct our minds. And it's a, qu- it's a question that is asked by Jesus in the middle of this passage. The, is, the question is, is this. Whom do you seek? Whom do you seek? We might phrase it this way, what do you seek? What is it that you're yearning for, looking for, longing for, to fulfill your ultimate happiness, the goal of your life? Where do you turn? What are you looking for? What are you longing for? Whom do you seek? I was listening the other day to Bono singing refrain after refrain. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I've gone up. I've gone down. I've gone all around. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Whom do you seek? Let's read our passage together, Romans 8, 1 through 11. I just said Romans, (laughs) thank you, John. (laughs) Thank you, John. (laughs) Thank you, brothers. John 18, did I say 8 too? I did, how is this okay? Pray for me, please. (laughs) John 18, 1 through 11. I have much more to say to you, but you can't bear it. No. (laughs) <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. John 18, 1 through 11. This is the word of God, holy and without error in all of, its, all of its words. Let's listen to it this morning. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place. For Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. It's already been a glorious day to gather together with your redeemed saints Brothers and sisters who love you, who've been called by the Father, who've been saved through the cross of the Son, who've been uh, illuminated, who've, who've, who've listened to the, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, who's caused us to be born again. We pray now that you would continue to do your work, Holy Spirit, with this passage today and shine your light into our hearts as we've prayed. We may hear you, that we may believe you, and that we may obey you. We love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. We've said before that the gospel 
of John is divided really into two books in a way, the book of signs and the book of glory. And now we move, continue to move into this section that we refer to as the book of glory. And it's upon this dark, dark night, in many ways the darkest night that has ever been in history, that Jesus' glory shines so brightly. We come now to really Act 3. Act 3 in the greatest story ever told. Jesus has met in the upper room with his disciples. He showed the full extent of his love by washing their feet. He shared his last supper with them. And he prayed his high priestly prayer. He has poured out his heart to them his beloved friends and disciples, and then he poured out his heart for them and for you, those who would believe because of their words. And now John shows us in this passage Christ's glory, the glory of his divinity, the glory of the divine Son, the only Son of the Father. And he shows it to us in in, in four ways. He shows us Jesus' divine courage, Jesus' divine proclamation, Jesus' divine care, and Jesus' divine commitment. So let's start with number one, Jesus' divine courage. John shows us in verse 18, verse 1. He says, when Jesus had spoken these words, as we've said, he's finished his high priestly prayer, he's spoken to his disciples. When Jesus now had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. Was there ever a greater Rubicon to be crossed than the little brook Kidron? Jesus steps across the brook to enter Gethsemane. And there he not only embraces, but orchestrates the events that will lead to his triumph on the cross. The Bible tells us that a great crowd came with torches, with weapons, Roman soldiers, temple guards. The New American Standards calls this group here, uh, the the ESV calls it a band of soldiers. The, The American Standard calls it a cohort. That word is translated spira in the Greek. And a Roman cohort was a group of soldiers that consisted of possibly 600 men, 600 soldiers in a cohort. There was another section of that cohort that was called a manipul, and that could have been 200 men. So it could have been as as, as few as maybe a couple of hundred, but up to 600 soldiers, along with the police officers, the temple court officers, and the Pharisees, and any other uh, bystanders who gathered along as they see almost a thousand people going into the the woods, going into the garden to arrest Jesus. So completely different, isn't it, than the the Jesus movies we watch and we see four or five guys coming. But that's because we realize Jesus is Jesus and he's not going to put up a fight, is he? And so in our minds, I believe, and even the minds of the producers of these movies, they're thinking, Jesus is Jesus. He's not going to put up a fight. They only need six, 10, 12 guys to go get him. But no, they sent somewhere between 600 and possibly 1,000 people to go and arrest Jesus. And they came with torches. They came with torches. Why does John tell us that? I think it's to, 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 to let us know a couple of things. One is that they are walking in darkness. They are walking in darkness, and so they must have torches. But they don't need it physically, really, because Passover happens during a full moon, And so there's probably light enough, but they're assuming that Jesus is going to flee into the olive garden, into into the the grove, and they're going to have to 
maybe chase him down, find him. They come with torches, men and soldiers with torches to search for the light of the world. John MacArthur says this about this passage. He went forth, and in our passage it says, he came forward in our version. He came forward, he came forward. It's his divine resolve, his divine determination, his divine courage. He moves to his own death. He is undaunted. He is unhesitating. He is courageous, courage courage far beyond a martyr just dying for a good cause. That's noble, and many have done this. But to go to a death that is not just a physical death, Jesus goes, right? To a death which will absorb all the wrath of God for all the people who have ever believed in him throughout all of human history. And God will unleash that massive amount of wrath in a period of three hours in which he will be forsaken by God to go to that event, that pure, spotless, eternally sinless Son of God. And to do it with a resolve shows a divine level of courage. Jesus crosses over that brook. He steps over the brook of Kidron and steps onto the battlefield. I don't know if you guys have faced fearful things before, or challenging things before. I'm sure that you have. When I was writing this sermon, it made me reflect upon my little brother, who was a pastor as well. Some of you know him. I used to call him Little Garen until a pastor told him he's told me he's taller than you, Kevin. He's no longer little. <laughs> but my little brother, Garen, Pastor Garen, I remember him preaching his first sermon. And he was probably about 12. He was very young, and it was very short. We, had, we would have, in our church, we would have nights, uh, used on Wednesday nights, that young men could give a sermon or give a short devotional talk to the congregation. And it was his turn. He had been baptized, and he was now a believer in Jesus Christ. And so now you begin to take your place among the men of the church and to begin to proclaim the Word of God. And he had prepared his little sermon. And I remember he had a, he had a green Gideon Bible, the little bitty Gideon, like New Testaments, right? He had one of those. And he was going to get up and preach to us. And he walked up to the little pulpit that they had set up for him. And there's the congregation. And as he laid his Bible and opened it up and got his little notes out, he looked up and I began to see his lip begin to quiver. And he didn't say anything. And he just looked at everyone. And all of a sudden, the lip quivered more and a tear sprang up here. And down come the tears. And he turned around and he ran out the front of the church where there was an exit door like right here. And he was gone. He cut and ran. I remember my dad jumping up and followed him out. And then we sat there as the pastor stepped up and said, Well, all right, that was a good, good attempt there from little Garen Bryan, right? When faced with this incredible challenge for him, he cut and ran. He was afraid and he fled. There's a story told about Alexander the Great. You may have heard this. One day the great conqueror was holding court And a young man was brought to him who was guilty of fleeing in battle. He was charged with being a coward. And Alexander looked at the man and said, What is your name? And the young man looked at him with trembling lips and said, My name is Alexander. And Alexander the Great stood up from his throne and with passion said, What is your name? And he repeated again, My name is Alexander. To which Alexander the Great said, either change your conduct or change your name. Either change your conduct or change your name. Jesus Christ always acted out his identity as the sovereign savior of the world. Jesus Christ knows his mission. He's known his mission and he embraces it and he moves forward. Jesus Christ never shrank back. He crossed the brook, and entered the battlefield. Having crossed the Kidron, he would then ascend up the slope of the Mount of Olives to that garden called Gethsemane. The other writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, tell us its name. Gethsemane means oil press. It is, after all, the Mount of Olives, and the olives are pressed there to make oil. And Jesus and his disciples had been there. They'd been there in the garden many times. They'd been there many times. Jesus enters the garden, and John 
may intend for us to reflect on another garden. Jesus there entered that garden to redeem his people from sin. But we remember there was the Garden of Eden where mankind fell into sin. Really, this sermon could be entitled on some level, the, the, A Tale of Two Gardens. The first Adam lived in a garden that was delightful. The second Adam entered a garden that was fearful. Adam and Eve listened to Satan, but Jesus spoke instead to the Father. Adam fell in defeat, but Christ conquered. In Adam, all were lost, but in Christ, all are saved. James Boy says this, Adam and Eve, by their sin, plunged their race into misery. They fell and carried their progeny over the cliff into destruction. Christ, on the other hand, stood firm. He did not sin, nor did he shrink from his work. As a result, he saved all whom the Father had given him. In Adam, all were lost, but Christ could say, Those you gave me, I have kept none. None of them were lost. That brings us to point two, Christ divine proclamation. Jesus' divine proclamation. Verse 4, Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who had betrayed him, was standing with them. And Jesus said to them, I am he. They drew back and fell to the ground. The other gospels show that Jesus, betrayed, uh, that Jesus was betrayed by Judas with a kiss. Judas comes forward in the other gospels and, and kisses Jesus, and he asks him, are you going to betray the Son of God with a kiss? And we see here an interesting thing. As Judas comes to him, he doesn't offer the kiss of an inferior to kiss the hand or the kiss of a slave to kiss the feet. But Judas instead comes and kisses him, the kiss of intimacy upon the cheek, and, and gives him this kiss of, of a friend, of an intimate disciple, as if, as if to say, I'm, I'm back, it's okay. But of course, Jesus unmasks him and shows immediately the darkness of his heart and knows exactly what he's there to do. He's there to betray the Son of Man. Whom do you seek? John here emphasizes the glory of Christ. He asks the question, whom do you seek? They answer, Jesus of Nazareth. They're giving their, their, their arrest warrant. That's what they're doing. Why are you here? We're after Jesus of Nazareth. And in the Greek, Jesus doesn't say, I am he. He simply says, I am. Whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth. I am. And they collapse. They collapse. Jesus who's been proclaimed throughout the Gospel of John. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. Richard Phillips says this about this passage, Now standing in the light of the moon and the lanterns, Jesus answered the soldier's query with divine authority, I am. Before the flame of arresting torches spoke the voice that Moses had heard from the burning bush, I am who I am. Jesus proclaims he is the I am. This is the one of whom Isaiah says, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. By his voice alone, he shakes the universe. These men fall like dominoes. This is the one whom Paul says that the lawless ones will be eliminated with the breath of his mouth. He demonstrates by divine proclamation his divine power. He is the one who spoke into existence all that is, and he is the one who by the power of his words may destroy all that he desires. He is the I am. John gives us a foreshadowing of the great kneeling, the great bowing that will happen at the end of the age. Paul tells us this in Philippians 2, 5-11. Paul begins with encouraging Christians on what kind of attitude they should have. What kind of attitude should we have? We should have the attitude that is like Christ, humble and lowly. But then look at where, how he turns. Listen, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, having, uh, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, 
but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, now listen to this, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Where's, what, what dimension is left? Where's someone not going to be bowing? You're going to be bowing, where does he say? In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus shows through his divine proclamation that he is God. He is, yes, fully human and, yes, fully God. He is the I am. And they are undone. They fall before his glory. Point three, we then turn to see Jesus' divine care. I mean, I, I, you know, I, you, you can't even imagine all these soldiers, the, the clatter of weapons and torches and, you know, falling down. Then they all kind of get back up and try to assemble themselves again. And, and Jesus answers in verse 8, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. And then John adds this parenthetical comment. This was to fulfill, fulfill the word that he had spoken of those whom you gave me. I have lost not one. John Calvin says this, Here we see the Son of God not only submit to death of His own accord, but that by His obedience He may blot out our transgressions, but also how He discharges the office of a good shepherd in protecting His flock. Jesus here, demanding to say, say Who are you after? They say, We're after Jesus of Nazareth. I'm Him. I am. Then He says, I am. I'm the one. Let these men go. He's showing His love and care for His dear disciples. Jesus is saying, You're here for me. Arrest me. Let these men go. Jesus here fulfills the words of His prayer from John 17, 10 and 12. As He prays His high priestly prayer, He says, All mine are yours, as He prays to the Father. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus here, as the great loving shepherd, cares for his sheep. He protects them, and also he protects them and their fragile faith at this point. Calvin also says this, the evangelist John does not speak merely of their bodily life. He's not just speaking of their physical harm, but rather means that Christ sparing them for a time, made provision for their eternal salvation. Let us consider how great their weakness was. What do we think they would have done if they would have been brought to the test? While therefore Christ did not choose that they should be tried beyond the strength which he had given to them, he rescued them from eternal destruction. What is Calvin saying? He's saying, he's saying at this fragile moment of their faith, if Jesus did not physically protect them and they, they were arrested along with him, maybe they, wouldn't be, been, they would not have been able to stand the test. Jesus alone could stand this test, but, but their faith could have, been, could have melted. Their faith could have crumbled. Instead, he, he makes sure that these men are released and they flee into the night. Jesus profoundly gives them a way of escape so that not one of them will be lost Except Judas, except Judas. This is a, a living illustration, a living picture of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which is a promise that, that we ourselves can embrace and, and cling to as believers. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. John MacArthur says this regarding this section. He says, The reason we get to heaven is not just because Jesus says it, 
It's because he sees to it. Hear me. We don't just go to heaven because Jesus says it, but it's because he sees to it. The way we get to heaven is that the Lord prays us into heaven and prevents us from experiences that would be deadly to our faith. MacArthur has often said this, and, and we've repeated it here. If I could lose my faith, I would. If you could lose your faith, you would. The only way we keep our faith is because Jesus Christ is keeping us. Think of that. Relish that. Believe it. Have that draw you back to Christ. Have that increase your love for Him, your desire to serve Him. If you could lose your faith, you would. Because you're not all that, and neither am I. (laughs) But Jesus Christ is keeping us. He is keeping us. He is holding us. He is protecting us. And we see a picture of that from the garden right here with his divine care for his disciples and ultimately for everyone who will believe in him. Number four, Jesus, divine commitment. What happens then? They all stand up. Jesus says, arrest me, let these men go, basically. And then Simon says, yeah, okay, that's a good idea. And he quietly slips into the night, right? Jesus uh, here says this, and then, and then what does Simon Peter do? Simon Peter does what Simon Peter always does, almost, it seems like, right? Is he acts, he, he, he's impulsive, and he has a sword, and he draws it, and he strikes the high priest's servant, okay? And at least Malchus maybe is a good dodge or something, you know, but, but he goes for, for this servant. Maybe he's the closest one to him, we don't know. But he swings his sword, and he misses the head, and he cuts off his ear, The servant's name was Malchus. And so Jesus turns to Peter and says this, Put your sword into its sheath. Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father's given me? And then the other Gospels talk about him healing this man. The last miracle that Jesus does is putting Malchus' ear back on. I don't know if he does. he pick it up. I don't know. Does he just put his hand up there? Who knows, right? He heals the ear. And it's amazing that the whole group doesn't fall down again <laughs> and go, what in the, you know, my ear, oh, you know, and then he's healed. We see Jesus even caring for his enemies in this, don't we? His great love and concern for those who, who hate him at this point. There's a movie to be written right there, you know, Malchus's ear. <laughs> you know, I don't know what the title of the movie is, right? But what, what happens to this guy? Is he, he's got to be, his life's got to be changed forever, right? But he turns to Peter and he says, put your sword into its sheath. This is not the way these things are going to happen. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? He says, Peter, don't try to stop me from doing the will of the Father. You could almost say it this way, Peter, by trying to save me, I will lose you. I have to be I have to go to the cross. I have to do this. I have to continue on this path. I have to go through this tribulation, this anguish. I have to die. You can't save me. If you try to save me, I will lose you. The cup to which Jesus refers is the cup of God's judgment and wrath. This figure of speech is used several times in the Old Testament, contrasting the cup of judgment with the cup of blessings for obedience. Isaiah states to Jerusalem during the time of Israel's exile, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, I have drunk to the dregs, the bowl, the cup of staggering. Jeremiah and Zechariah both speak of God's wrath in terms of a cup of judgment for his enemies to drink. This was the cup that Jesus was sovereignly determined to drink, taking into himself the last dregs of God's wrath and judgment for the sins of his own people. Jesus will drink the cup of God's wrath. Jesus in sovereign submission to the will of the Father will go to the cross to achieve our salvation. He will go to the cross to, to, to achieve our salvation. So we ask a question at the beginning of this sermon. Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? There's only one. 
who has the divine courage, who can give the divine proclamation, who has the divine care, who has made this divine commitment that can help you, that can heal you, that can save you. There's only one who had the courage to face the cross, only one who could, compl- who could proclaim with authority, I am, only one who has the ultimate compassion to care for his sheep, only one who could drink the cup of his father's wrath for his, th- for his flock. Acts 4.10 says this, Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Friend, whom do you seek? Whom are you still seeking? Believers, brothers and sisters, who are we seeking? There's only one name that should come out of your lips right now. Who are you seeking? Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your incredible son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for being reminded this morning of his incredible determination, his resolve to do your will. Lord, we know that in every situation that we've been in like, like this, we would, we would simply turn back. But he did not. We thank you again for our Savior. We thank you for his death on the cross. We thank you for his resurrection, for raising for our justification. We pray even now, Lord, if there are those in the congregation who have yet to put their hope and trust in Jesus of Nazareth, that they would do so even now. Lord, we're asking you for a miracle. Only you can do this by the power of your spirit and the preaching of the gospel, that you would take away their heart of stone, and give them a heart of flesh. Lord, help us who have already put our faith and trust in you to continue to seek Jesus of Nazareth, to walk with him, to walk after him, to love him and glorify him as we we ought. We love you today, and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. The elders will come forward now, and if there's anyone who needs any prayer, you can come up for prayer or counsel. Let's stand and sing God's praises again.